Hi, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Sasha Brown, the Director of Professional Development at the CFDA. And thank you so much for joining today's conversation on fashion and culture, how Web3 will define the next generation of designers. Today, we have an incredible group of experts who are all pioneers in the space, and they will be sharing their insights on what Web3 means for fashion. Leading this conversation for us is Rosie Perper, who is the senior editor for Coindesk Learn. Rosie focuses on crypto explainers across blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFTs, and DAOs. Previously, she was the managing editor at Hypebeast and helped launch Honeymoon, focusing on fashion, art, and music in the metaverse. So before we begin, uh, quick housekeeping that we do host a Q&A at the end of the hour. So please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of the hour. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Rosie. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to dive into this topic. Um, so when we think about traditional fashion, whether it's couture or ready to wear, there are often existing structures in place and specific barriers to entry that create additional challenges for emerging designers. Networking opportunities, supply chain issues, and even the cost of physical storage can hinder young creatives from getting their foot in the door and defining the future narrative of fashion. Enter Web3, an emerging digital landscape that many view as the next stage of the internet, where crypto concepts like NFTs, tokens, and DAOs are building new opportunities for creative expression. So joining me today are some of the talented names helping to shape the future of design in Web3. Uh, so we have Simone Barry. Um, she's a multi-hyphenated uh, creative innovator and strategist, currently consulting and advising for the biggest NFT metaverse and crypto projects globally, including five crypto at fifth column. She's also the co-founder of People of Crypto. Uh, we also have uh, Danny Loftus, a digital fashion founder, influencer, and investor. She's also the founder of This Outfit Does Not Exist. And we have Gala Maria Verbanich, the founder and CEO of digital fashion lab label Tribute Brand. Uh, and possibly joining us a bit later is Hilary Tamor, a sustainable fashion designer based in New York, running one of the most pressworthy emerging brands, Colleen Estrada. So let's jump right into it. Uh, my first question is for everyone. Um, what does digital fashion mean to you? And why does the fashion industry need Web3? I can start. So for me, it really means pushing boundaries limitless creativity when you look at web three it's a creative and financial opportunity it can you can create without a financial moderation your vision can exist because you want it to exist not because someone else says it can't it allows creators to monetize beyond the traditional gatekeeping so let's just say you want to create x dress and retailers are like but this dress is in you don't require them to talk to it. It's what your vision is, what you're seeing. It connects you directly to your community in Web2, you would call it your consumer. And it ensures that you are monetizing on your art. It's considered the creator's economy. I'd also just like to point out that Web3 is not just NFTs. It's not just apes. It's not just open metaverses. It's blockchain technology which is, as you mentioned, the new era of the internet, it will foundationally change how we transact in the future. So you're looking at intellectual property, content, I can't speak, authentication, social tokens, content rights, domains, usernames, supply chain, transparencies, all of the things that are really important in our industry will be changed. So it's beyond just the idea of NFTs, PFPs, metaverses. Web one, you would get on the internet with your name and email. Web two, you now need to get on the internet through Facebook, Google, and Twitter. Web three now allows you to connect directly through your wallet. And I think for me, this is what's the most exciting, really being able to push this creative narrative and being able to create ecosystems that sustain a creator, not just the gatekeeper. Well said. Um, Gala, did you have yeah. uh, anything to add? 
Yeah, for me, I think I got into digital fashion. I don't call it digital fashion. I just call it fashion. It was, and this, this has been repeated for many times right now. Fashion is all about self-expression and I express myself in digital or virtual worlds. So I don't think fashion is on the streets anymore. And I just kept searching for a place where I could create fashion right now. And where was it happening right now? And it was digital space. I love that. <laughs> I love that too. Um, Danny, what about for you? So I got into the space almost two years ago now and I think part of my role in the space was really helping people to understand exactly what digital fashion was because I think when you say digital and you say fashion it could be anything from gaming to just e-com sites and so for me I've broken it down into three distinct categories the first of which is IRL or in real life digital fashion and this sounds a little bit oxymoronic but it's any physical garment which was created using a digital backend. So that's everything from Hilfiger and Burberry who are using digital patterns, but actually creating physical goods to this growing quantity of physical fashion items, which have an NFT somehow linked to them. So we are seeing a lot of integration of tools such as NFC chips, which give you that ability to both authenticate that your clothing is genuine at kind of a very base level, but then also gamify and reward people for the process. So I was speaking recently to a very prolific digital fashion designer, and he's thinking about ways to incentivize people to wear the brand together. So imagine if, let's say all four of us were in the same place and we were wearing a digital fashion item, and then somehow we get rewarded because our clothing recognizes each other. So that's what I call IRL in real life digital fashion. So physical fashion, worn on human beings, with a linked digital component. Second category is ORL or on real life digital fashion. And that is what I originally came into the space with. So stuff like the incredible clothes that Gala is creating through Tribute Brand. And the process there is a human being will send in a photo or let's say use an AR filter on themselves and they will become dressed in a digital fashion item. So it's bridging your physical and digital identity and creating this amazing unison between the two. And then the final category, which I think is the one that we're seeing most rapidly expanding right now and is also the most novel, is URL or unreal life digital fashion. And so where unreal life digital fashion is digital fashion worn on a human being, this is digital fashion worn on a digital personification of yourself. And so that could be your gaming character in Fortnite. It could be your picture for profile on Twitter. So, you know, your board ape, your crypto punk, or it could just simply be any digital representation, not necessarily linked to a game of yourself. And that's this new direct avatar economy of dressing those. So for me, that's the kind of breakdown of how I would define the larger category. And then I think why Web3 is important, it's just really simply just ownership. So you look at games like Fortnite, which are essentially massively lucrative revenue generating e-com companies. You know, millions of dollars are generated through the sale of these digital clothing items. The average player spends $108 dressing their avatar in this game. But you might spend $108, but the clothes are trapped within that game. They do not belong to you. If the platform goes bust tomorrow, you can't take those clothes with you. You can't modify them. You can't monetize them. So quite simply, they're not yours. It's the equivalent of you saying, I'm going to go to a shopping mall and buy an amazing dress. But actually, if I resell it, I can only resell it in the mall through the shop and I can't wear it outside of the mall. And so it's quite simply giving the same ownership structures that we have in physical fashion to these digital garments and then I think and a little bit more but that's just the base level of why web3 is so important. I absolutely agree and this sort of takes me to um, my next question uh, for everyone which are what are some of the misconceptions that people might have about digital fashion versus physical fashion and you know why might people want to um, invest in clothing that they essentially can't physically touch or wear? Danny, do you want to take this one? So I'm happy to. 
So I think, I think it's kind of, it's twofold. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about NFTs is that they are these purely speculative assets. We've seen so much in the media around these NFT booms and these NFT busts. And I think what's interesting for the people who are really working in the space is when, let's say a month ago, the price of ETH dropped, people weren't running for the hills because there is a core group who genuinely believe that these digital assets are core parts of culture. And I think, you know, what deterred me originally from a fashion perspective is quite frankly, the, the appearance of these goods, a lot of them, or just NFTs or PFPs or whatever is literally horrendous. You know, it's part of the culture, but if you have any type of enjoyment of aesthetics, you look at the majority of these things and you are quite literally repulsed. So I think we're going to see this shift where things are going to become far more, you know, aesthetically compelling. Gala's work, I think, is one of the best examples possible of this. And then I think the second thing is why this is this actually valuable. What we've seen over the past, let's say, 10, 15 years with the advent of social media is that all of us are curating a digitally native identity, you know, be it from the MySpace era, be it on Instagram, be it now on TikTok. And what we had in that identity is we had these curated versions of ourselves. So what we were doing was we were picking moments from our physical lives or curating moments from our physical lives and then bringing them into the digital sphere, bringing them onto the web. What we're going to have in this next iteration of the web is fully digital identities created from nothing. And one of the things that made, I think, a lot of our jobs easier was Meta saying that they were fully committing to this and going into this direct to avatar economy. And I think therefore, when you buy right now, first of all, you can buy this beautiful collectible item, which hopefully you will have just an innate connection to in the way you do to a piece of art, but also in the very near future, in the same way our identity is crucial in the physical world and fashion is of course in the business of identity, we're going to have to portray ourselves in these digital realms now and digital fashion will become one of the most crucial components for all of us to do that. I also think that there's still a misconception that digital fashion is new. Digital fashion has existed for decades. I think that we need to remove the mindset that only physical has value and that virtual does not. And that's where we're finally seeing it as generations move in. I believe it's 74% of the population are easy gamers. So they're already participating, as Danny said, in this economy. Additionally, I just want to center that, that physical and digital both have value. Digital has more value. At the end of the day, if you think about how much Google is making, that data conversation and what data is worth is tremendously important. And as we evolve into a more digital world and we can now, as Danny also mentioned, have ownership of this data and have ownership of our digital life, you are going to see that value perception twist and we're already seeing it. And for that, we can be thanking NFTs and PFPs because it has put a new value on something that does not exist. Yeah, this is what I was trying to say. Yeah, this is what I was trying to say earlier. I've seen there is no physical fashion. There is no digital fashion. There's just fashion. It was a thing that with clothing, why fashion is connected with clothing right now, it was the most easiest way for us to express our identity, which was happening in the physical world. But identity expression has shifted much, much earlier, like with MySpace, with Instagram, with all of this social media, this is where we express ourselves right now. And this is where the fashion is. And if you look at all of the PFP projects, like CryptoPunks and everything, I think this is like the layer one or, or layer zero of digital fashion. This is like the first step of someone owning an item that's ex expressing themselves. And that item is behaving in the same language as fashion is behaving in the physical world right now. And just a note, your digital identity and in Instagram, Twitter, all of these places are not yours. It's owned by those platforms. That's the vast difference between Web3. Your digital identity is yours not there so if they decided tomorrow yeah we're not really feeling you we don't like what you're saying bye all of that gone web3 all of it's in your wallet 
cool, I'll just go over here. And these are the things that we need to start unlocking our minds because we have really just been programmed to follow this idea of what these things are. And the deprogramming begins now with understanding Web3 blockchain technology and how foundationally that changes how we transact and how we operate within these worlds. Absolutely. Gala, um, I would love to for you to speak a little bit more about Tribute Brand. Um, essentially, uh, your designs are contactless cyber fashion, which removes shipping, waste, gender, and sizing from traditional design. So tell us, for anyone who is not familiar, a little bit more about this concept and how your audience utilizes this technology. Yeah, sure. I think this is a perfect answer to sustainability. Um, because we all know sustainability is just a marketing term. So I started, yeah, I, I started researching like six or five years ago, how me, my generation and people younger than me express their, their, their selves. And I realized it was those Instagram photos, what, what we spoke about earlier. And this is when I realized those people actually don't need physical garment because they're actually using it in a digital area and then i just realized okay well, i don't have to produce sustainable clothes and tell people to buy less use organic cotton or anything similar to that i can actually pr produce fully digital items that even look better give people a better feeling about themselves and those those items are like 100 percent sustainable sustainable this is like 100 percent zero waste so this is where, where, where the story with Tribute Brand came from, because our garments were like, we, we didn't ship them. They were genderless, they, the size didn't matter, and it was made on the screens. So we didn't, we didn't use any physical materials or anything else. And people looked better than they looked any, like, any like before. And when people wear your digital garments, um, it shows up on their avatars or on their bodies themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So this was this was the first utility we developed. We call it Private Brand Premium Fitting Service. So actually, our garments were not sold as NFTs. We we actually rented our garments to be worn on users' photos. So they went to our website and they paid the fiat currency to actually rent our 3D garment and that garment was delivered on their photo. And with that, this was pre-NFT era, they also received the certificate of authenticity. So they actually uh, knew they owned this image of them themselves so they could easily spread it out over the internet. Excellent. Um, so a question for everyone. Um, I know that there might be some traditional designers that are listening in or maybe business owners, um, and they might be hesitant to embrace this uh, fashion movement. Um, so how can traditional designers or consumers get involved in Web3 without having to do a deep dive into different concepts? And what are some of the Web3 tools that might be of use to businesses or to consumers where they can just sort of start to get involved in the space? So I think education is extremely important. There's a lot of misinformation that's just floating around. <laughs> understanding the difference between a centralized system that's using Web3 terminology. So for instance, a meta, a Fortnite, a roadblocks that references metaverses versus an actual open metaverse. So you're looking at Decentraland, Sandbox, crypto voxels, and these types of areas. I think understanding what Web3 really means, just on a foundational level, you don't have to deep dive. And then surrounding yourself with what does this mean for me? As I mentioned, it's not just about PFPs. It's not just about digital fashion. It's really how your business is going to interact within the internet as we evolve. So maybe for your business, you know, a creative service is not exactly, but it's really important for you to be able to authenticate your garments, be able to track transparency. So if you're in sustainability, have that supply and transparency. We need to move beyond. It is the creator's economy. Obviously, all, all of us on here are creators and really are excited about the monetization and 
what that means, but you can also look at it outside of this and really just embrace blockchain. I think there's a lot of great tools that are slowly coming out. A lot of platforms are popping up. I think that you can look at these metaverses that have open code for you to develop. I would also look at like Ledger that's really focused on securing. There's tons of marketplaces. To me, it's just first and it seems really basic and it's not as sexy, but understanding what the technology is that you're building on. And there's a ton of information out there. Obviously, you can follow these incredible women that are also building their thought leadership, understanding how they've entered the space, Twitter spaces and clubhouse rooms and all of these other places. You can just sit and listen. It's okay to not understand it. I think that it's being built as we're speaking about it. Right now, there's someone creating something totally that does not exist right now. That's the exciting part. Embrace the chaos get ready for change and just move through it and humbly understand that none of us are experts up here. We may have been engaged in this space for a longer period, but we're all learning. And I think a lot of it, why people are hesitant is the misinformation and the fear of not understanding and feeling stupid. There has been a thousand meetings that I have felt stupid in. I have left those meetings. I have educated myself. I have re-entered those meetings and felt very confident. And if I can participate, and I see this humbly, anyone can. I came from a fashion design background and fully pivoted into Web3 when I understood the power of the economy and what it could do for my communities. We have to just, the, the word of like, it's not a choice. You're going to embrace it. It's the question of where and will you be late or will you be early and will you be a part of the development, will your voice be heard as it's being developed? And to me, that's so important, especially with emerging designers who are really setting the cultural layer that larger brands are taking. Blockchain shows the receipts. So the reality of your creations and your IP, they can't take it because it's already laid in. It's not that it can be erased. So you can finally, be compensated for your creativity and what's more powerful than that and that was a long tirade apologies that was fabulous and uh danny did you have um anything to add about tools for uh, people to get involved in the space especially for designers so i love everything simone said because i think one of the biggest issues in the nft space is the fact that there is purposefully incredibly complex language. You go into the space and you don't see people who look like you. You see people who are saying a ton of stuff which may not resonate with you. It makes you feel stupid, partially on purpose. And for people who come from fashion backgrounds, it's not particularly friendly, exactly. All the things that Simone identified. And I think what's very important to point out is that the rules of this are being written in real time right now. Nobody has the answers. Everyone is experimenting. When I first came in, I was just going to clubhouses and there were like 40 or 50 people. And this was two years ago. Nobody was writing about digital fashion. Nobody was engaging at all. And it was just people throwing around ideas. And yes, we've come quite a long way from there, but we haven't really, you know, this is this intense period of experimentation. And I think both what that means is exactly as Simone said, you can have a piece in shaping it and shaping it towards fashion and shaping it towards your world. And, you know, with this outfit does not exist and also with Drop, which is the platform I'm building. That's my thesis on how this will evolve and how it should evolve. And anybody can really take part in doing that themselves. And I also think it's that fact that educate yourself, but never feel stupid because everyone is learning and there is no formal education standard around this. Like I founded this outfit does not exist to come close to giving it from a fashion perspective, but you can really understand this for yourself and never ever feel like the question you're asking is stupid. And if anybody makes you feel like that, it's because they don't actually know the answer. That part. Um, Hillary, I'm so glad that you uh, are joining us. Um, I'd love for you to speak a little bit on this topic about um, 
tools that uh, designers in the space can use. Um, and I also know that Kalina Strata, your brand, uh, really focuses on fearless fluid attire that's meant to be sustainable and radically transparent. Um, so what are these ideals and how do they sort of um, work their way into this Web3 space? Well, we've done a lot of digital components so far. We've done NFTs. We try to stay off the blockchain right now um, while it's still like in sustainability flux, but I know that it's like all being changed very soon. So we haven't crossed over into Web3 yet, but um, we have done a lot of NFT. We've done a digital fashion show that was only digital garments that you could buy in a one section in InView, which is a different subcategory. So it's not technically on in that realm, but um, I don't know. I just think it's like really amazing to be able to create a digital for me as a designer who makes a ton of in, right, in real life clothing um, to be able to design with something that can defy gravity or doesn't need to have like these barriers of like, how is this going to stay on the body? How is this going to like execute is really like thrilling for me to be able to just make whatever I want and not have to think about how it can be executed. And so for me, it's like a really amazing space to be able to create in and have like zero um, rules or anything and just be like, okay, now she has wings and now she can fly and she floats. Um, and for, I just think it's really interesting to really be able to push your brand identity into that direction and create this literally anything that you wanted to create um, with zero limitations of fabrication, of colorways, of anything. So literally anything your heart or mind can think of is you can be able to create in this space, which I think is amazing. Um, that is that is so true. And uh, I want to go back to something that Danny had mentioned earlier. Um, you mentioned Meta, uh, they're a big name in the space. And there are a lot of really big names that are um, dominating um, in the space, in the Web3 space. Um, so how can emerging designers really make a name for themselves? And as the cultural architects of Web3 are beginning to emerge, how can they really set themselves up uh, for success and, and set themselves apart? So I can speak to this a little bit. I think, you know, I came into the space with an Instagram account with zero followers, with, you know, a Substack with no readers. And because of how nascent the space was, I managed to get the type of traction that I would have never been able to get had I been a traditional fashion influencer or a traditional fashion writer. Same thing with, you know, my fundraise, same thing with like the people that I currently work with. All of the big names are trying to understand how to engage with this. And so in, they have to come to people like us because we are those who are most authentic. So I think in that way, there is this chasm where young emerging designers and young people who are excited about the nascence of the space can come in and really start to fill that and accelerate their careers in really incredible ways. I think what's also very important to note and why I am so passionate about digital fashion conceptually is the fact that it has these amazing disruptive potentials because the things that traditionally gate people from entering or being successful in the fashion industry, be that the high cost of production, be that the fact that you in general need to be centered in a major fashion capital like New York or Milan or London or Paris, no longer apply. And in that same way, you get to surpass a lot of the gatekeepers. You don't need to get your clothes in vogue to be successful. And so I think what's so amazing is you can learn these 3D tools. You can get them onto an influencer, use algorithmically generated systems where I've had photos wearing gala stuff that have gotten 500,000 views. And you can start to boost and propel your brand from anywhere in the world. And Yes, the architecture of Web3 is being formed. Yes, these larger designers like Dolce & Gabbana and Givenchy are coming in. But first of all, the entire mechanics of the space are around disruption, are around empowering and financially empowering emerging creatives. And secondly, I'm genuinely of the belief that in a similar way to streetwear, the brands which really convey context and culture and what cool is for the next generation and for the Web3 native generation are not necessarily going to be the same fashion houses 
which have dominated in the physical world. They have very different value systems. And just as we've seen with streetwear, which began as a bottom up cultural movement, and now you're seeing collabs from the luxury houses every other day, Web3 and Web3 fashion is going to be grasping this new next generation community. And instead of us going to the large brands, the large brands will come to us. And so I think there's no better time to engage than now. And if we set this up correctly, there'll be no better infrastructure to flattening out who can enter the industry and who can be successful. I love what Danny just said, because one, what I immediately heard is that you entered the space with a clear purpose and you built and grew your community around that purpose. And I think for Web2 brands moving into Web3, it's something that I constantly say, there's a difference. And purpose is one of the things you're building community. Your purpose is what's driving that community, your growth strategies and community incentives. It's all about the value. It's about a collaboration. It's about unity, not just consumers. You're not just selling to them, you're building with them. And that, again, that mindset tweak is something that small brands really have to engage in. And again, test and learn you're not going to get it right immediately. Partner with established platforms, people that are aligning, collaborate with brands, projects that you really feel fit what your brand ethos is. Really be selective. And again, entering with that purpose is so important. That's what we did with POC, our people of crypto. We had a clear purpose, mainly built out of frustration because the market is what it is. However, our purpose is to educate, to invest, to ensure that brands maintain their DNA promises of Web 2 in Web 3, that projects that are claiming diversity are actually diverse. The market right now, right now we have all of us, actually women, versus 84% of our industry is male. So it's really exciting to have all these voices that are coming from our POV, but the reality of the market, it is 84% male. And why we started People of Crypto and why we have our diverse avatars is because we need to be visually represented. I'm entering rooms where I am not seen, spaces I am not seen. You're watching diverse projects that are all about diversity and the team does not have anyone diverse on it. The idea that we're entering spaces and building technology without everyone being reflected, again, it will just be built for a group of us. It is necessary for us to enter and create these new POVs and that brands that made these substantial commitments to diversity and inclusion in Web 2 are not finding a loophole in Web 3 and trying to skirt around it. They have a tremendous amount of power in ensuring that we don't have the same problems of the past. Our name is, P I always say POC because it's people of crypto, people of color, people of culture. The one thing I love when you talked about streetwear, streetwear originally came from urban brands. It went to streetwear, it now went to luxury. The creators of that original trend never were compensated to the level that you're seeing now. Black and brown creators, LGBTQAI, substantially add have unprecedented consumer power and influence yet they are not able to monetize at the same level of these mass brands web3 changes that it allows you to have that creative power and is extremely important and i will yell about this all day long because it is so increasingly important for us to change because we are at the foundational level and to build web3 differently because honestly, I don't know how much impact we can have on Web 2, but I am fully committed that we can have Web 3 impact. That was, that was awesome. I, Thanks, I love that. Art. It's the one area that I can literally talk about all day long, because one of the things for us is that, especially for my community and coming from fashion and watching Black and brown women create these incredible things, watching Black creators on TikTok create such amazing things, and they're not being compensated. We are not making the same. Women in general, we are not making the same. So when we're looking at this new technology, if we are not in the room, if we're not part of the development, we developed avatars that look like us. We developed a game that referenced 
what the global majority looks like, and that is people of color. So as we move into this space, we need to be very cognizant of every brand that's moving into it. It's your moral and financial obligation to ensure that you are building it with this foundation. Um, Gala and Hillary, I know that you guys helm um, fashion brands. Um, so do you have any advice um, or you know, just uh, secrets to success for emerging designers that are um, just starting to uh, enter the space? Yeah, <laughs> the secret to success is that you have to have a good product, of course. Uh, but I think what Danny spoke about earlier, this is true because I, I don't think there's there's point in making physical fashion and more we, we have enough clothing in this world uh, right now and everyone's trying to make physical clothing. So it's a very competitive space. And if you come into a space with something new in a place where people actually need it, it's, it's much, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's much easier, but the the whole surrounding and placement it, it's better for you and basically you know it's you don't actually need to create physical prototypes you don't have to hire pattern makers you it, it's much the process is much quicker the distribution is uh, much easier for you and you, you can spread it uh, everywhere you want and it's actually in a place you're producing things that will be that people will actually need in the future. So this is a thing we actually covered a bit earlier. Right now, regarding the utility, if you just want to produce digital fashion, there is no right utility right now, because, for example, with AR, people are still using it for fun. With metaverse places, we still don't have like a, this one metaverse where people are actually spending their time in. So it's right now it's about creating those those places that we all all are creating with our own visions or on how this should look but also i think what's a good thing is also to look into how people call it i don't like that world but it's a digital space so where you actually connect physical garments with the digital versions of it so i would say it, it, it's like that <laughs> and i guess i would say for any emerging designer that needs some guidance, just always be yourself, always stay true to yourself. Um, if there's some, don't try to design for other people, design for what fulfills you always. Like, I think you can be caught up in, or even I can still to say like, oh, what's that girl wanna wear? It's like, no, what do you want these people to wear or in what whatever space, whether it's in real life or in the digital space and just try to make things that um, feel honest and utilize your community around you. You know, your friends and your family are there to help you and to be your, like, you need, you're gonna always need support um, for everything that you do because it's constant, constant, constant working, struggles, everything to make it in this, whatever, on any space, whether it's in real life or digital. So just use your friends and your family and, you know, do create amazing things with what you can. And think limitlessly, set the dress on fire, have some fun. And Gala does incredible pieces that is just not possible in real life. That's amazing. Like when you're looking at creative fields, this is what we want. Not to have like, no, that's not the right fabric. No, we can't meet that. Yes, please change this, this, and this, because the retailer asked for this, this, and this to be changed. No. This is so true. And uh, it brings me to the last question that I'll direct at everyone before we open up the floor to um, questions from uh, the audience. Um, but we speak about limitless possibilities and you know creative expression. So if we look towards the future, kind of going back to the theme of this conversation, uh, what are some of the ways that Web3 is going to shape the next generation of designers? Uh, maybe, maybe I can talk about that. What's, what's been most interesting to me in the last couple of years is actually how fashion will look. Because I think it won't look like clothing. Right now, what you see, what we do at Freebit Brand, you can still recognize this is a dress, this is a coat or whatever. But I think in the future, like the shape of fashion is going to be something I can even, I can't even imagine right now. And this is 
so, so interesting for the future designers because all of the techniques we needed or they needed before are going to be lost. We, we won't need pattern makers anymore for producing fashion. We, we will need something else. And this, I don't know how it will look. So for me, this is the most interesting part, especially the part where I imagine how people who actually don't want to be in the center of attention or people who just want to dress basic how they will look in those roles because they will also need fashion there. That just made me think, think of the educational system. What will fashion educational- Yeah, it's, education it's, it's going, I think in the next next five or 10 years, like the tools and the things people learn at fashion schools, they are going to be totally different. I think the theory and all that part is going to stay the same because I think everything functions on the same level doesn't matter what the medium is, but the tools and how things look are going to be totally different. And I think this is the part where, where fashion will get excited again. I agree. I think around that, what's also very interesting is, you know, as I said earlier, fashion is in the business of identity and where you wear your clothes is also reliant on context. So it's reliant on having a group of people who appreciate the way you self-express, who appreciate what you wear. And we briefly touched on, obviously, Meta is making a very big play to really be the central place that you congregate with your digital identity. I doubt that's going to be reality. The way that I see the quote-unquote metaverse is numerous different virtual spaces that you shift in between and going back to what Simone was saying about the importance of Web3, you need your digital clothes to be able to come with you as you move across those worlds to have this consistent digital identity and express who you are. That being said, I also see designers who will favor one world over the other. It could be because of the graphics quality. So imagine an ultra HD virtual world versus something that's hyper pixelated one may lend itself to a system of design slightly better than the other. And you may also see communities congregating around a specific aesthetic, as we see in the physical world with you know, streetwear, luxury, et cetera, but based in these virtual worlds. So I'm really excited to see how and if designers choose to translate their works based on these completely new environments where people will be wearing them. I think interoptability will assist us in that, in the aspect that your metadata can then be transformed within these metaverses and looking at how that evolves. So a digital gamut here, as you move through, and I, th I think that was a really valid point, you have ownership. So if I'm now in, let's say a Decentraland and I decide to go to Sandbox, my garments are coming with me. In a meta, they're going nowhere. And you had made that point earlier, it's like shopping and not being able to take your clothes out. It's there versus here's where I am, being able to utilize and show. And even in like these decentralized spaces, you're looking at AR lenses and more ways to interact. Web two and web one, well, web one's kind of gone. Web two is not going anywhere. Eventually it may be more of, I want to say a hybrid version. Eventually we're going to go through that moment eventually it will be all web three but right now we're still hybrid -y. and because we're so early like ownership i'm circling back to what danny had mentioned to me it's going to shape the way that we monetize simply put a creative creating a dress having that ownership selling that the no the purchaser can now monetize on that dress and the original designer continues to monetize. That is something that we have never been able to crack within fashion. You have someone that's purchased, then there's no resellers, they resell it. As you continue the selling process, the consumer loses and the brand doesn't win at all. So the reality of Web3 now looking at this new monetization model where you're again collaborating and both sides are continually monetizing. I mean, that in itself for small brands changes the game. Larger brands may not be looking at the secondary market, but a smaller brand, that 5% over 10 years makes a larger difference versus just it's out. I have no connection to it anymore. 
And that's the value and community and the collaboration with community, how you build garments. And I think around that, Simone, because I think we didn't, I don't think we broke it down to like the most base level when we talked about Web3. If you have a digital fashion garment that is based on the blockchain, you can program in royalties. So you can program in compensation mechanisms. So every single time that garment changes hands, the original creator will be automatically compensated. And exactly as Simone said earlier, so much of what we've seen in streetwear and street culture as it filters upwards leads to the original creators not being compensated when their work goes from being a $20 piece to a $2,000 grail piece. Whereas with this new compensation mechanism, you can have that. And that's a complete game changer across the board. Probably why I'm most excited about it. Because it does, when we talk about gatekeeping and financial models and variables and how you create, you are literally free to create your vision. This is your community, your vision, you are sharing and you are moving through it in a way that you can continually monetize and add value to your community beyond just product. And that is, again, the mindset tweak that we all need to start engaging in. It's actually possible to be equitable, to share. It does not just need to be these central powers deciding that we only go through them. Yeah, I'm done. Awesome, I'd love to, yeah, open it up to Q&A now. Great, so the first question we have from our audience, let's direct it towards Hillary. Um, Hillary, what types of digital programs have you needed to familiarize yourself with to start working in Web3? This person is, is a designer and traditionally works with Adobe Illustrator. So, you know, since we just talked about, there's gonna be a whole new slew of people needing to get educated um, in our industry to get to become familiar with this, what would you suggest or where would you start? I mean, I've done everything in Unreal Engine, which is like a video game thing. So I'm not sure if that goes in line with Web3. Does it for you guys? Do you know? Yeah, it goes. It goes. It does. Okay. I really like Unreal because you can really do like a 3D yeah. element and, and they have a lot of different um, templates you can use and change and shift. And it's really a great program. So I would recommend that. Yeah, me too. I think like more, most traditional program is of course Flow 3D. This is something that most of the fashion designers will be familiar with because this is this software is actually made for prototyping physical fashion so that you don't have to produce. Uh, physical prototypes, but I think this is the like level one. I think Unreal, what Hillary said is an amazing program and they just released a new version of it. So you can go there and there are also other programs you could use for like just 3D modeling, like ZBrush and Blender basically, and put it all there. But there are many, many programs right now. And if you have an iPad, Procreate's also a really great tool. Isn't there also Marvelous 3D? I think it's called Marvelous. Which it's, is it's, it's, it's the same, it's the same yeah. as Flow. But, but actually, I would also recommend like physical designers to use Flow just for the physical production. It's also, it, it saves time. I agree. I think Marvelous has a game mechanism that allows you to plug in through the skins, through the GTFL file. So, I think. Um, so anyone feel free to, to chime in. Can a fashion brand maintain its core creative identity if it decides to become a DAO? Could it still have a creative director or does that defeat the purpose of the DAO? And maybe someone can um, also just share what a DAO is before we answer that. Uh, yeah, I can give a, a, sort, a sort of brief on what it, it's pronounced DAO, uh, but this is new technology, so um, everyone's learning here. Um, so DAOs are essentially um, utilizing different Web3 tools to uh, come together, uh, whether it's to 
buy an asset or to govern um, a particular space, but it's essentially a collective that is uh, making decisions about a particular um, asset or item. Um, so it's a really great way to collaborate um, and make decisions um, as a unit. So I'm curious, yeah, uh, how DAOs would work in the for I think I think curation is important. So I think you will st still need a creative director or a couple of creative directors, but it's also good to make creative directors function like a DAO. I think DAOs will be important, but I think mostly from a perspective of the community and your users, so they could actually be part of a brand. So kind of to add to what Gala was saying, I'm part of one of the most well-known digital fashion DAOs. It's called Red DAO. And we are more specialized as an investment vehicle. So we invest in Web3 native companies in the digital fashion space, but we also do create our own collections. And I think what's very important when you think about Web3 is decentralization is very much something that's on a sliding scale. You can engage these mechanisms like a DAO where the way that it works is when certain decisions are made, a group of people will vote on chain. So they'll put their kind of ballot through the blockchain. And when that comes through, that's how a decision is confirmed or denied. And I think one of the reasons a lot of people like it is let's say from a financial point of view, my DAO controls our treasury. So it controls the amount of money that we have to invest in digital fashion companies. And if we were in a traditional business structure, there's always going to be concern, there's always going to be mistrust, there's always going to be a degree of hierarchy. With our DAO, the money will not be deployed. It is absolutely impossible for a single person to go and deploy it without everybody's consensus or a degree of consensus. That being said, exactly as Gala said, as decentralization is on this sliding scale, you can have certain things which are voted on using a DAO, using your community, but then a group of people or a single creative director who makes the ultimate final cut. So, you know, let's say it's, there are 50 colorways and you can get the DAO to collectively vote to maybe narrow it down to five. And then you can be the one to make the ultimate decision. You could even have a DAO of consumers that votes around which product you would like to produce. So to answer your question, you can do this on a sliding scale. So no, you do not in any way have to silo the brand's core values or the creative direction that you have determined. And you can also bring in those tools at the same time. Well said. Thank you. And clearly, I didn't know what a, a DAO was as I pronounced it wrong. So thank you all for making sure we know what we're talking about now. Um, Daniela, this is for you. You mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, fashion, IRL, ORL, URL. Where do you see the biggest chance for people to showcase their digital fashion in the near future? For example, filters on Instagram or Snapchat versus gaming. And how likely do you do you see its adoption with people not as familiar with Web3? So these are brilliant questions. And I think, I think I can actually see it evolving in stages. So I think the first category of consumers, which are the consumers who are less comfortable with Web3. Yes, at the beginning of the panel, we said that you are going to become increasingly comfortable with having a fully digital identity. But for all of us, you know, we're not young Gen Z, we're not 12, 13 years old. So this transition will take time. And so I think for us, it's going to begin as I have a physical item with a digital component. And in time, you shift to having a unique bond with that digital component in a way that no longer requires you to have the physical. But I think for the majority of us who are of the physical fashion generation or kind of on the cusp, that's a five, 10 year transition, especially as you need those contexts where you're excited to express your digital identity, where it means something to you for you to engage. I think the second category, which is ORL, on real life digital fashion, I think that's really going to proliferate as we see these improvements in AR. So there are obviously incredible creators working on it at the moment, 
But when we start to have a universe where you can do an entire TikTok dance or you can wear digital clothes on Zoom, as we were discussing, I think that's going to be a great bridge to bring people in. That's going to happen in the next kind of one, two, three years. Already Snapchat's investing heavily in this. There are incredible brands and companies like Gala's which are investing in this. And then I think this final category, this URL, is what really the true future is. I think filters and you know this symbiotic digital identity will always exist, but for the generation coming up right now and for the future of fashion in 50, 100 years, these fully digital identities present the largest opportunities and the largest segments for disruption. And I think one of just the most basic reasons is, yes, I could flex on Instagram with a filter, but when these filters are costing, let's say $50, $100, I could also just go out and buy fast fashion. So you are still competing in the ORL world with physical clothes. For URL, you are not competing there at all. So you need to have those digital clothes, which can only be supplied by these nascent designers only within these platforms in order to express yourself digitally. So that means it's a completely disruptive open market in a way that filters still are not, and because they're competing with physical fashion, may never be. Thank you, that was great. I'm gonna just sneak in one last question and anyone feel free to, to respond. How do you think the volatile value of crypto impacts how the public sees Web3 and digital fashion? So we're in crypto winter, however, a bear market is where you build. And I believe, raise your hand if you raised in crypto winter. Three of us have raised during crypto winter. So the reality is this space is growing and people are building. Did it go like this and ebbs and flows 1000%? If you've been participating in crypto for or since the 2008, you're aware of the highs and lows that we go through. It does not impact it in the same way, maybe from a financial standpoint, but from a building and an engagement and a participation. If anything, this is giving you a time to participate earlier at a lower threshold of entry than waiting until it goes up and then trying to enter. So for me, what I've seen and what I'm excited for is the fact that there is a lower barrier of entry now. If you were looking at last year, many of the ways that you would enter was beyond anyone else. So as the, those that just came in to grab cash and make money fast and not really worrying about building into the ecosystem, most of them have moved out. The people that are here now are really committed to building that ecosystem. So it's a perfect time to enter. I'd also just well, say- well, to, yeah. <laughs> Very, very quickly, I'll just say to add to that, yeah. um, Someone very close to me who was a trend forecaster once told me that a trend knows that it's successful when it stops being a trend. We are going to move towards a future where you're not going, this is an NFT dress. It's in the exact same way as Gala said about fashion, it's a dress. This is not NFT art, this is art. And I think that's point one. And obviously the media speaking about NFTs negatively, positively, it's always going to sway the kind of general consumer. And that's why we need, um, we need education so much. But I also think what's happened and what we've seen in this recent run where, you know, everyone was doing NFTs is a ball has started rolling that will not be, will not be stopped. So Gucci is now accepting crypto payments, Farfetch is accepting crypto payments, Off-White is. So now that these ideas have been seeded, everyone is building. So it's no longer, is this going to be a fad? It's definitely not a fad. It's something that is 100% here to stay, regardless of wider market sentiment. And again, that's one of the reasons why it's the best time to get in right now. Yeah, and I also wanted to say that we uh, at Tribute Brand, we don't see our, ourselves as an NFT or blockchain or crypto brand. We are just a fashion brand. We see this thing as a protocol, as like in a traditional world people see fiat currencies or payments as something as a protocol that makes people get stuff so it's not about being nft or crypto brand it's about creating products that are good and that people actually need and there, there's always need for something like that 
Thank you guys. Those are such helpful um, and insightful responses. And I know we're a little over time. So thank you for everyone who stuck around for the Q&A and just a huge thank you to Gala, Simone and Daniela and Hillary for joining this conversation and to Rosie for so beautifully leading it for us. And I know we talked about a lot of different resources and platforms and I'll try and get and collect as much information for those that are interested in learning more and share it with you uh, in a follow-up email. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.